is in Rebecca Keller. She's an artist and writer, recipient of grants from the National Endowment of the Arts, two Fulbright Awards, the Illinois Arts Council, and a TED Talk. She has exhibited her artwork in the US, China, and Europe, including at the MCA in Chicago and Portland Art Museum, Jane Addams Hull House, and the Estonian National Museum of Art, and many others. That's very, are you from Estonia? Are we I am to? not, that's oh, where oh, I had very, a full break. Very exciting, yes. Um, her book about her projects in public historic sites, Excavating History, when Artists Take On Historic Sites was published by Stepsister Press and her essay, Na Mazes and Mirrors, Reflections and Play was published by the Franz Hall Museum for the Trans Historic Museum Project. Keller's fiction has won her the Betty Gabehart Award and two Pushcart nominations, congratulations. She was a finalist for the 2013 Chicago Literary Prose Award and her first novel, You Should Have Known, is newly released by Crooked Lane Books. Penguin Random House. Um, it's very exciting today. Rebecca had a um, an exhibition last uh, spring. It's fall now, and um, so this is uh, a continuation of the fabulous exhibit that she had. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And please take it away. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, yes, I am an artist and a writer. I recently published a novel, as Paula said, and. Uh, I joke with my students, I teach at the School of the Art Institute, and I joke with my students that I, um, they, they say, what'd you start writing for? And I joke that I didn't you know, get enough rejection and work for no money as an artist, so then I had to start making novels. <laughs> but, but the body of work I'm gonna uh, talk about today um, is a an, sort of an ongoing uh, project with various iterations. And I thought I'd start with this, um, where it really began, which was in Eastport, Maine, um, a, a town, in fact, it, it bills itself as the easternmost city in the United States. And you can, you really could see Canada from my house there. It was, it was way, 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 way out into the Pacific Ocean, closer to Newfoundland than anything else, um, on a place called Moose Island. But there's a, a remarkable uh, place there called the Tides Institute and Museum of Art. And they um, were founded actually by one of their founders is from the Chicago area. In fact, I live in Oak Park. She grew up in Oak Park. She went to the School of the Art Institute. Very, she's a fascinating person. Uh, she and her husband started um, preserving buildings in Eastport, Maine and becoming uh, and, and building this incredible art collection there. And as part of keeping it contemporary and kind of in the mix with conversations, they built uh, a program called the Studio Works Residency Program. And this is the sign outside the wall that you see here. The, the Studio Works Residency is actually held literally, I'm gonna write, this is gonna be treacherous here. <laughs> is, uh, this is the studio. This is my studio. Looking, look directly at the ocean. It's just the ocean is right across the street. And um, and they wanted in making this uh, residency, they wanted um, the proposals to be uh, socially engaged, public participatory. And you know that that term, socially engaged art, is sort of last ten years or so, fifteen years, been very current, but. Basically, it means it, it can it mean can mean a lot of things, but it means really that you take um, a, the social context of the artwork and the public in, into some sort of fold that into the process or something. And um, oddly enough, given what you're looking at, and uh, this is another oops, I, go, I went too far. This is super super sensitive. Oddly enough, what you're looking at, um, given what you're looking at, this is a little bit. Uh, it's an island actually in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. The impetus for this project started at a farm in North Dakota. Uh, because my, so Eastport is a historic fishing town. And most of the buildings and you know, the, the, the historic reason for the town was that it was, it was a very rich fishing town. It's a very deep port. So boats would come in very close. Uh, Native, there's a very strong native uh, American presence 
could have even the scale that had a traditional fishery with sardines, but then commercial, there was a commercial fishery of sardines, and they had all these big cans that now get turned into galleries and etc. Um, and and I started thinking, so in a place that has a history that is so connected to weather and to what's going on in the nature, it made me think about my mother who grew up on a farm in North Dakota. And you know, you can take a girl out of the farm, but you can't take the farm out of the girl. You would, I would talk to my mother and she would give you almost the first thing she'd talk about would be the weather, but not like, oh, it's so nice up here. She talked about the weather when farmers talk. Just not, you don't get rain soon, and they can't get the tractors out. And if it's too wet, you know, they can't get it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And in a way that was, it just meant all different things to farmers. And I assume it has to mean different things to fishers, to the fisher people as well. So that got me thinking, even though this is no longer really a fishing town, it got me thinking about what do you talk about when you don't when you want to talk to someone and you don't know what to say? To talk about the weather, right? It's like it's one of the few safe things to talk about. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful out there. It's sunny. Oh, it's so cold. Or I'm not ready for the fall. Whatever it is, you get the elevator. There's a stranger, somebody here at the pool, at the well, cold water cooler, talking about the weather. But of course, that's also in a town like this that is has seen so many changes due to climate change, due to other things. It also seemed like it could be a really good way to begin conversations. That then had the potential for getting deep. So that's what um, what I did. So I decided to do a project called What Color? I decided this project called What Color is the Sea? What Color is the Sky? What you're looking at is a sand dune that I would put out of my studio every day. It was on the main street. It was right next, it was right across from one of the restaurants in town. It was right next to the hardware store. If you walked through this downtown, you had to pass by the sand dune. And basically, the instructions were this. You, you, I went and, and hit up um, paint stores all over the place and stole, borrowed uh, <laughs> hundreds of paint swatches. And here's, here's my studio. And put this outside and ask people to do a very simple thing, which was to take a paint swatch and hold it up against the sea and the sky and to try to, to match it. Now, this is impossible. You know, it's a paint swatch. It's not the sky, and you move one degree, and it's different. This and the people would have conversations about. No, I think it's more like this. I think it's more like that. So people really got into it. It became a prime motivator for a lot of conversations, which of course did, as I had hoped, lead to all kinds of other things about the history of the town, about what they were doing there, about the ocean itself. Ah, thank you. Where's the Sorry, this thing is so touch sensitive. Is that it? No, that's not it. Oh, there it is. Okay, sorry. So here you see people kind of engaging with the process, having a conversation. And they would write down, you can see here, this says, you know, Friday. And they would write down the time and the day. And every day I would then take these different turn this right Oh, up. sure. Oh, thank you so much. That way you can stand on the edge. Thanks. Not trip on this. Yes. Great. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So um, in the studio, I had stretched long, and I mean quite long, 15, 18 feet long and quite tall four, five feet, six, six feet by, they were six inches tall, and they were about, I don't know, 15 feet long. They stretched them across the studio wall and kind of divided them up per day. So each day was about 18 inches long. And I would take these swatches and take them up next to me, along with the photographs that I take and the photographs that people set that they saw on this. And construct these paintings uh, uh, each day would be basically a log from this is a little bright here. I guess you can't see it. This this painting was made. Um, this photograph was made at sunset um, 
and you can't really see it very well, but the, the reason I chose it is if you were looking at it on the screen, you'd see this sort of rosy glow coming in from the, this is a, gives you a better idea of the scale of these paintings and each one looked at. So this was a cloudier day. We were there between May and June. <clears throat> and uh, you could see the beginning, the first week was much cloudier and there's silver rays and glowed and then once you got to June, it got much brighter, um, more colorful. It's another view. So I ended up with several very, very, very long paintings. Now, there was another aspect of this. So this was, this was the in the front window. And this was the first iteration of a piece called Anisys. Uh, anybody know what Anisys is? It's a part of the knee, but what, it's actually the word is that. Yes, it's, a, it's basically a, a thin film. So it works on your knee. And you know, if you take a spoon and you pour medicine or water in it, it will just go over. That doming action is that that skin of molecules, the molecular tension that holds it into the dome rather than it just gets flat and explodes, that's a meniscus. And so um, I began to think about um, if this is water, water retracts, it's, you know. So I took a bunch of clear bases. Again, these were all crowdsourced from people who happened to have, you know, empty bases. And I filled them with different colors of water. And every morning I would come in with, and this is just two dots, it's not being to it. And I would pour the water as high as it could possibly go. So it, it got this meniscus. And because, and, and it was a perfect, I thought, metaphor for, um, for climate and, and our environment and ourselves, because every, the light that comes through both reflect and retract. So as you walk around it, every color would change as the light came through the vessel next to it. Um, and, um, and yet, and it would, because it was water, any vibration or anything would register. So it was this kind of, ex, it, and it was also very simple and very beautiful. So here you can see the image from across the street reflected. So I have a little video that I've made. Ah. People always thought these were solid vessels until they move in or touch it, and then they. You can see sometimes they look blue, sometimes pink, sometimes green, sometimes orange. So another little historic factoid. So these, these were the front window. And they were great at big people's. Um, all of you probably, or some of you might have been at Carboys, which is a big brewer's with a five gallon glass. And once in a while in like old neighborhoods that are sort of leaning to the historic facades, you'll see in a, a pop of them. Um, Blown glass vessels filled with colored water, partially covered too. And that's um, a base from the days when apothecaries used to add, get, that used to be a sign of an apothecary because they would, in a way of them advertising their skill in mixing chemicals, you know, to achieve these different colors. So this, that was also sort of a historic callback. Anyway, so that project was really successful. People really loved it. Uh, the museum acquired one of those paintings. Um, and I, I found it a really fascinating paper because it, it provided, it felt authentic sometimes, uh, but just enjoy our projects can feel different. 
for the art that we want to see. And I, this, you know, I kind of by accident found out something with what the arts. So uh, the following summer, I was invited to a residency at Lake Side Mission. Another body of water with the resident, with the studio here in Lake City. And I thought, I want to read to do another innovation. So this painting was made, these paintings were made at Lakeside, Michigan, um, looking at Lake Michigan. Um, and again, you probably, I don't know if you know what Lakeside is, but it's, you know, you, you can walk along the shore from every state that's going around the corner of the Chicago through the little corner of the Indiana to end up in the It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, these, I, you know, it's the same, essentially the same methodology. Um, and you can see here, and these are done at different time of year, different body of water, which brings us to the Evanston Art Center. So Evanston Art Center then invited this um, exhibition here. To, and I thought, well, this is right, a unique area associated with the lake. I want to continue to do this. I want to continue this project. But it, it's not, it, was not, it was an exhibition. It wasn't a participant. So, uh, so the first thing I did, this is the opening, you can see here, and this is, uh, it was a gallery that was upstairs with a long gallery, and in the, uh, through the length of the gallery, I had the diff different pedestals with all these different vessels, again, crowdsourced, filled with different colored water, and you can see here what starts to happen as you walk around, this is my left, and it's left the stairs, crosses the line, crosses the color. So the color, and of course, as people walk by, it would um, vibrate. And the walls were lined with the paintings from both Lakeside and Eastport. So here's another view. Um, at the far end there, you can see, I also made, it, it's good that these are here. These, these things here, I had transparent. So let me, the reason I, I wanted to mention that this was an exhibition rather than a, a studio-based project or st here at Evanston is because um, in a studio residency that is socially engaged, you have an opportunity to have these conversations. You can contextualize them. Uh, in a in a exhibition, you don't necessarily. I mean, obviously, I have today and we have the open, but we don't really have the necessarily the the kind of contextual basis and. Um, what had become clear to me over the time I've been thinking about these two bodies of water is that, you know, the, the title of the exhibition was All the Water That Ever Was Now Is. And that was taken directly from a 1990 article, <laughs> which was an early, not early, maybe but an earlier uh, call to arms about protecting water. And what they said is it was actually all the water that never was now is. In other words, we don't get we don't, we don't get any water. And uh, it's a form of tonics. What happens to water in Lake Michigan eventually happens to water in Eastport, eventually happens to water in the East, which is the next stop in the civil water journey. Um, so it made me think about a kind of commons that we have to a resource that we have to find inside. But of course, not all of us have to the benefit of access to water, access to clean water, and not all of us are the, as my word might be, about how to care for resources. So in order to create that context, um, so what you see here is a, a uh, printout on very sheer fabric, similar to this, of uh, demographic mapping of like Michigan, and um, and also a weather weather reporting map of Lake Michigan, and I'll I think I have there's a, another image from the other, the other side, and that was part of the contextualization. And um, these are the two images that were printed. Um, you can see here the demographic data and here the weather um, I'll, I'll, that along with this. I had a lot of these um, QR codes up there, 
and you could use your phone and they would link you to all these different um, all these different organizations and governmental entities that were engaged in the protection of our water. So the Friends of the Chicago River, demographic data about different communities on the water, water protectors, um, the in Indiana, I found it very fascinating putting this together. Indiana Department of Natural Resources, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, and Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. All of those cities are in the Chicago, in the Chicago land area. And, um, and all of those Department of, of Natural Resources function very differently. They have different departments that organize very differently. Their websites are more or less opaque. I found that very fascinating for Chicago. How many people come, you know, water, water, what we have. There's so many entities who are charged in one way or another with regulating and protecting um, and, and uh, allowing usage of our water. But part of the reason I wanted there to be demographic is you know, we, we are here to be in a very lovely, privileged neighborhood that has great access to clean water. Very Indiana, on the same lake, we share the same water, has a very different kind of and, and the same with, with Wisconsin, you know, the parts of Wisconsin that are kind of um, recreational, there's lots of access to the lake. You get to the lake, you can use the water, you can play in it, and other place, places where the water is perhaps too clean and not so easy. So I wanted to sort of underline that context by, and this was the way that I kind of landed on to have it be um, active and participatory in, in the context of an exhibition when I couldn't be there all the time. All right, so <clears throat> so summer of 2021, that was in Maine. Summer of 2022, I was in Lakeside. Summer of 2023, I was in Jackson County. I was in Skokolos, which is the Skokolos Foundation in Paris. I was a invited fellow there. And this was the view for my student. It was tragic. Um, so um, Paula mentioned that uh, an earlier body of work dealt with this sort of stuff. And I've never really let that go. So um, in researching social work, it's on the Aegean Society, which is just the opposite. And, um, and I started thinking about how that describes you know, the nature of not the sea. Um, and I also start to know what it has to say on the island. And it's a their traditional um, things of fishing that supplies to it. Also wine making, honey making, and olive oil as, as, well, as well as uh, there used to be the monitors a kiln all of the all of those materials were also also commonly used in art materials in the So I thought, okay, I'm gonna make paint about the water, but I want to use these traditional materials. So this so I started making paintings with this is made with honey and um and pigment. Honey is, makes it actually a very nice looking uh, It's very viscous. It changes the color, which is kind of tricky. Um, I also, this is made with traditional media. So I did a few just, you know, to remind myself of, you know, traditional landscape painting. So th this is a, a cloudy day. This is a painting I made that day. Um, but I started thinking about, um, you know, um, Water and the history, and I came up with this idea of these vessels. And very common property on the island were these, um, these traditionally shaped vessels. So they, they look like amphora, like every like hundreds of years before. And they were all over the place, really cheap. Um, and so I started thinking, well, I'm going to make, I'm going to do some sort of actions with this idea of these traditional vessels. Honey, olive oil, wine, and blue and white paint with this colored blue flag, and the turkeys, everything is bright white, lighting the white with these sort of 
So I started making these. Oh, those. I think you can see it very well. I can probably see it better here, what they kind of look like. Um, and I also made these videos of pouring them. See if I, oh, here's another kind of view of once, once the olive oil began to kind of soak into the pigment, they became very messy and mucky and, and gooey and, and quite beautiful. Um, I would also, I would do these things on, um, on top of a, of a slab of white marble, which is also a very common um, And uh, it was just a scrap marble and um and then when i would take all this stuff off i would use it as a printing press and they would put the paper on it. so that's what this is it's a, a an impression of what was left but here's a i think a video if i can get it to play I was pouring with my right hand and trying to film with my left, so <laughs> a little wonky. It's a local red wine. My studio smells great. There's the olive oil. And then I took it, the, it outside and I did a number with uh, various vessels that I found just sort of thrown out um, in front of the seat. If this had sound, it would create the wind and mess with the birds and the kind of blunk blunk of the wine. Um, I am not a video person, and I'm not a, a technologist. Either. So my hope for these, and I, I just have not had time to do them this summer, is there's a, a new trend a new translation of the video that just came out, and um, I want to. So in the video, the video obviously the studio there came from the studio how they mentioned um, uh, olive oil. They mentioned all these materials, of course, they mentioned the water. And I, um, I really want to do some sort of have a, figure out an act of sexual coming to the better relation and trying to collect things in the area of privacy and include. Thinking, wow, it's 
Sure. Um, well, I think we're nearly at the end, actually. I have another video, but yeah, I think we're at the end. Your time is perfect. Oh, I just wanted to ask something about that. But then, right into the same thing, you can do the same thing with each other. Funny. Um, did you fix it up? I, I, you know, I did this a number of times to get the light light. It was very tricky actually to get the light light because uh, it was the sun was so bright that if I was indoors, it was just too dark, or you didn't get that beautiful kind of sun. If it was outdoors, I couldn't, I couldn't even see what I was doing to film it, or it would be so glary, or the shadow could be so stark. So um, I I did a number of days of trying to do that. And then I had one of the days that was once I figured out it was possible to help with my video I could do so. Uh, but I tended to do the same, but not always. But just wondering if there's like a reaction, like the honey when I'm thirsty and the wine is getting nice. Yeah. Like having over that because it looks really beautiful. There's yeah. some carrots that they played that or some sort of art accidentally. Yeah. Um, and I think the reason was because it was so beautiful. And yeah, it had that sort of um fast food thing that sort of beat the fast food. So maybe yeah. The other thing that um I realized after I made these is because I'm not, you know, I don't spend a lot of time with that product. The little bit that I do spend and after having done this, uh, people have like said to me, well, you know, if you can work those places, there's so much food up there, like wow, you know, so much interest in like silicone. If anything that's kind of floppy and blue seems to have the negative camera left it, but, but so you know, I can't claim that I, I was part of that while they didn't part of the conversation, but but it, yeah, so you know, to your point, like the, the honey I kind of didn't start with. Because it was very, it's just so beautiful. And sometimes I would look at it and sometimes I would put the album on because I could see why it contrasted with me. These are all. But then I just kind of resisting the wine, so you have a beautiful pattern of the blend is in the ceramic and then it worked. Yes. Or is that actually? And just let it have a little interesting and sure. not only chemical interactions, but physical interactions between these different yeah. consistencies. And I was yeah. wondering, do you ever sort of kind of just let it sit up drying something? I did it. Think, but what did that feel like? Well, it felt like um, it pissed me off because the gloves had. Oh. Um, the studio was quite full of people, and and uh, like you, I thought, oh, because it was just beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Like, the kind of like the crumbly color and the red yeah. kind of melting. Um, but and by the end of the day, there's you know, there's a lot of honey, a lot of stuff, and I left it out. I tried to cover it, and I was just full of hair, like lots of hair. Yeah, which is why these are cycle might be. That's when they started making yeah. like, the, the print, fresh prints because I thought, well, oh, these. And they, I have to say, I think I started doing this really toward the end of the residency. Yeah. And I wish that I had thought of the, the, you know, the, the visual art they could possibly do to be able to trace this and get this soon. Uh, but I had to leave a lot of things behind. I, I would love to have kind of. You know, when you're, I mean, that's one of the things that comes up to me all the time that I have using sort of my initial processes, you discover things on like, maybe a little bit too late. <laughs> you figure things out, you're like, you know, you know, you want to redo that. You don't necessarily, I mean, I can do it here. It's not quite the same as what I can see in that. <laughs> but that's a great question. I had another. I have another video. I think I have a second video. Is this it? This might be it. Yeah. That uh, the color of that olive oil is so 
It's so yellow. It's so. Um... And these jars you purchased? The local no, market? I found them laying around. Um, yeah, they were. Um, they're very, uh, very common, like in any tourist shop. And I just found them. I was looking at. But they're modern made. They're modern made, yeah. They're not they're not in any way precious. And then this guy I really liked his seemed to me like he looked mm -hmm. like a Mytenean figure with it was it's upside down. I just tipped this upside down. <laughs> Yeah, the honey and the wine are one some of the few things made from Alabama. Some of the few things made. So you're really using the vessel as a treatment. Especially here. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, I didn't bring them back to Chicago again. Uh, one, uh, the, the images I showed you at the, at the front were broken. They were already broken. Yeah. So some of them I would break and do other things with. Um, but yeah. I think yeah. that was a good Yes. Yeah. 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 They were just sort of skin up to sort of the things over there. Yeah, I mean, it's fun. It's fun extremely much to the point of this bro it didn't take it kind of broke it didn't have to be that it didn't be so sticky when it was the last was. The other thing is um washing the stone, washing the the, um, the oil and the honey uh and the wine and the pigment the corn was like really almost like pigment really really sticky. Um so and I also thought it would be fun but the, the white and the, I had wanted to find lime, lime like that, but they were that close to those. I think about there and then that people are there and then they were I think it was like what is the biggest um is that what you said? Yeah I'd like to make a really good one. I have some of the things and I have some of the I don't know if they're missing. I think uh, the, uh, the, the foundation has to be. So I gave them a So I want to. But I do, and I did not go planning on making a video. But the historic kind of um, circumstance of like this new translation. Love that book. So I made sure you didn't want to see this and, uh, and, and select parts of the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you try to save any of them? Is there I, I, yeah, I watched them and that. But um, I, some of them I watched. They were actually the very beginning. So you can see this, uh, this one. I could not get the blue off. That was one of the first ones I did. And it, it was the, um, I think that one I used, that was probably where the oil was and the pigment just like, right, couldn't have gotten it off if I wanted to. Um, yes. Yes, because you know, as you, as Paula mentioned, we came up to the classroom. So, yeah, I thought of that immediately as soon as I found this. Because the ones that were broken, I also found. But, yeah, this is to your point. We didn't do 
And honestly, I think we need to sort of give yeah. what? Like, you should, those are absolutely worthless. Yeah. Like, those are you. Pour over the <laughs> yeah. 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 Speaking of epoxy, I must confess, I absolutely love your installation upstairs with the water jar. And the first time I saw it, I was like, it's epoxy here. And I was like, is that epoxy? Because it, it, it is like that, as you said, about a meniscus. And I was like, and this project that was so captivating that feeling of almost spilling over, like as you were talking about that tense strength. So, um, yeah, epoxy, like, I don't know, it's okay, very, it's very, very in that, that's very pleasurable and truly appreciated. <laughs> I know, yeah, uh, but that yeah. kind of tension was really, and it also, you know, I mean, I'm a professor, right, so I can theorize things, but it's also, you know, the kind of fragility of that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 It was just water. So. Just water. It, it was, and it was having a frightening spilling over. It's a dead moment. It resonates really well. So and here you see these are this is one of the some of the broken ones. Um, and um, yeah, it was, I was just like, oh, I mean, recently using shards of pots. Perfect job on on marble. So what? Where is this pot now? It's still here. When I first saw the slide, I thought that was actually like. Yeah, no, yeah, no. I mean, and you know, there are obviously it's it, 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 I find it interesting to think about the relationship, their relationship to time because a pot, a shard, they're the oldest thing we have to build with ceramic pots, and you know, it's referencing this Google text, um, and it's using these old materials, but it's a, it's and honey is a preservative. Doesn't spoil, uh, but at the same time, I don't know how you would you would preserve these. I guess you could close them and put them back into the glass or something. So the video is just there. Yeah, when so, someone a, a friend of mine for some reason just talking. <laughs> it's like a heart. Yeah, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so thank you so much. That is uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Always oh, fascinating. I know. I get. You know. I really want. I need to contact the uh, the Hellenic Museum. I think they should probably. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> they may only work. <laughs> I know. I that's what I think I need to do is not instead of wasting my it's not wasting my time, but the amount of time I spent, like I spent one week trying to figure out some editing and stuff. But isn't it important for your residency is all about is the and all the yes. sure you want the yes. Finances. Well, I did that when I came back yeah, and, yeah. and a little bit there. Um, but but it's like you know for me to do this, which is probably I, the simplest of tasks for someone who knows the software uh, and who has the software. Of course, I'm using like three things in different countries. So you have how to, you know, easy, you know, for, for non technical files to do. And I'm sure somebody, probably half my students, could do this in 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, anyway, so I think I, I need to rethink that plan about making, you know, like maybe having that something simply have to sit next to me and do it rather than just try to figure out the work. Yeah, well, that's, that's the key. Right. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel to go with different seasons now? Like, do you want to go to Maine in winter? And like capture those colors for you know, like, I mean, you would sit your city for a long time and you could tell a lot of the colors, which should think from the beginning of right. your residency to the end. Right. Now, are you going to be 